Welcome to the CEO of Destiny podcast, where you will find the tools to fulfill the purpose of your generation and wildly succeed in the marketplace. And now your host, Andre J. Benjamin. Welcome to the CEO of Destiny podcast. I'm your host, Andre J. Benjamin. And today we'll be talking with an author, best-selling author, New York Times best-selling author. Um, he has two phenomenal books that he's put out to really impact people from three simple steps and secrets to a successful startup, a recession-proof guide to starting, surviving, and thriving in your own venture. Um, he count, you're, you're, he's from the United Kingdom, if I'm correct. And uh, so don't let the accent fool you because he's been in Washington State and, and he's kind of a jet setter and snowbird and uh, he has... A, a lovely a bride that he was married to for some time, 40 years, and he's going to share about that and how he come, came to meet her through a very significant person as well. And uh, he, he seems very interested in coaching people on how to effectively launch startups while doing it in a five-hour workday. So please welcome Mr. Trevor Blake. Thank you, Andre. Trevor, how are you today? Uh, great. That's a great introduction. I appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. So I'm I came across your book because I was, I read a lot of entrepreneurial uh, books, but mainly from founders and people who have actually executed rather than the theory, theory people, because um, I felt in doing coaching and doing consulting, I want to give people stuff that I know is proven rather than things that are, you know, a publisher told them that they need to, <laughs> you've got an obligation and this seems to be a hot trend. So you know, put this out and then they kill the game. But as you said, prior to us starting this interview, the, the readers left with some other things. So can you talk a little bit about what prompted you to go on the author journey? Because yes, you are an entrepreneur and you are a founder and um, now, you know, investor, I, I suppose, and things of that nature. But what got you on the author journey? Just give us a little bit about that. Uh, what you said actually is that, you know, I've, I've read so many self-help books and business development books and there's very little for the startup out there, but there's a lot of books on, on management style and, 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 you know, business culture and stuff like that. But they, they always leave me sort of thinking at the end of it, well, well so what? So, so it makes me feel better about the life I've got, but what I really want is a better life. What, am, what do I do? So, so um, I was in an airport one night, actually. I'd just sold my first company. And I told my wife I was going to take a sabbatical and she raised her eyes as knowing, knowing me too well. That's not going to happen. But anyway, after about two weeks of pacing the kitchen floor, she said, if you don't start something new, I'm going to kill you. So that night I happened to be going to the airport and picked her mum up and there was a new self-help book out there and I picked it up and I, I just, I, I wanted to go and get an airline vomit bag. It was it just, there was no practical tools and techniques. It's just, you know, it was silly stuff like, you know, affirmations and all that stuff without any practic practicality. And I'm a very pragmatic guy and I'm a physicist actually by trade. And so I like to know why and how things work. So when I get a book that's sort of nebulous like that, it puts me off a little bit. And so I decided, okay, I've, been, I've had this book in my head for a long time. So yes, I will write this book and keep my wife happy. And that's how I came, that's how I did it really. So it's, it's about, it's about what I learned as a kid. Cause I grew up, you know, in a hard scrabble life, very poor and, had I not had the ambition to change that situation, I would have turned out like my dad who turned out like his dad. And I didn't want that for myself. So, the, you know, the, the, my resources were the library because I was suffering from sectarian bullying in those days. I was, I was an Englishman Absolutely. in Wales and in, in a time when the Welsh went to the English out. And, uh, and so there was some pretty serious bullying going on. And so sometimes I fought, um, you know, I'm only five foot eight, so that didn't go very well. <laughs> but, but other times I ran away and I hid in the library because those idiots were never going to go to the library. And I just started reading biographies and I was so inspired by all the stories of, of adventurers and business people and musicians and all the rest of it from all different times, all different cultures, all different, you know, countries. It, it was incredible. They all seemed to exhibit these several small number of, of, of similar habits and, uh, and, and attitudes. And I just simply adopted that for my own life. Can so you think that became can, three simple steps. So, uh, can you think of, uh, take, you know, I know it, it, you, I don't know how often you do that, but if you go back a little bit to that time, since we're just becoming familiar with you as the audience is getting introduced to you, what, as a young boy, can you think of like two or three of those, you know, names of people that you read and you said, man, I resonate with this. This is, this is connecting with me, his story or her story. Who, who was hitting you at that time? The most inspirational for me was Madam CJ Walker. Wow. Uh, and, and she's a hero to the African-American community, of course. When Absolutely. Wide. But I mean, I, she grew up, you know, she was uh, 
born to slaves just at the time when slavery was abolished, but the rules that were around the abolition were even worse than slavery itself. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and women was, were, were, were not, not only suppressed or subservient, they were totally ignored and they were, they exactly. were viewed as worthless. And, you know, also, you know, growing up in that environment, not a lot of support and encouragement. She was married at 14, beaten, abused, just yeah. a terrible, terrible thing. I mean, I, I thought I had a, had a hard time until I read her book. She was one of the first biographies I ever read. And then I realized, you know, Trevor, stop complaining and, and, and crying about this. You know, look what it was like for these people. You know, and she went on to, uh, she was so badly abused and so malnour malnourished that she lost her hair and she tried all kinds of hair tonics and nothing worked. And so she, she like the best things in life, you and I were talking about this earlier, the best things in life are when you, you, you have a problem and you set about fixing it yourself. And so she made her own hair tonic and it worked. And she went door to door selling it. And from that start, she became America's first female millionaire. But she didn't just stop there. She then used her influence and her power to start to change some of the, some of the things that were happening to that community. And uh, she became a, very, a huge advocate of the anti-lynching laws and things like that. And she went against authority, a very brave woman. I was totally inspired, but I also noticed that she did these three sort of things too. She had incredible mentality control. Absolutely. She was able to not let what was happening to her affect her and, and uh, her opinion of herself. And she was very close to nature and she liked to meditate, but she wouldn't have called it that. She called it by different things. I call it taking quiet time because I like to keep it simple. And then she set these huge targets for herself, even though it seemed impossible. And, and she just let life fill in the details. And that's kind of the, that sums up three simple steps, really. That's really what I've done in my life. And from the age of, say, you know, 14, uh, rubbish at school, I went to become a star student got fantastic uh, 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 education and results. Yeah, and then yeah. when, talk about, talk about that, that, uh, when you went to, I remember in your book, you, you talked about um, kind of the, how do you say it, the, the, the disbelief of your educators to, to kind of see the potential in you. And then talk about the role that your mother played in even you getting the, the chance to step out because you had, you had that academic uh, proudness and the sharpness and the resilience, but maybe your educators in that environment, how important was that about seeing the, 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 the ability that was in yourself and then pressing through what your educators thought of you? Yeah, I mean, I, I have my mother to thank for, for almost everything in my life. She was a tremendously um, powerful spirit. And she was diagnosed with cancer when I was seven and she was told she had six months to live. And she, I remember telling her, you know, I remember her in those days, we, we didn't have a vehicle. So we all had to go into the doctor. When she was going to get diagnosed, we all had to go. So the, the family of five. And so we could hear through the walls, you know, and she turned around to the doctor and she said, young man, you've got that wrong. I'll tell you when I'm ready to die, not you. And she, you know, in those days in the sixties, you know, when someone, when a doctor says you're going to die in six months, most people would lie down and go and die in six months, but she wasn't, oh. she wasn't having that. And so she was a tremendously inspiring woman for me. So, I, so she always said to me, Trevor, stand up tall, look the world in the eye, and you can achieve anything you want. And I believed her because she's my mum, right? More. And then so I decided that I wanted to become a Royal Naval officer. Now, you have to put the context of the time. The, that was the Royal Navy, the officership in the Royal Navy the Academy was for politicians. and Absolutely. And, and airs and all. it wasn't for a, for a scruffy lad from where I was living, you know, who had one pair of shoes and neither, you know, they were different sizes and different colors. And, um, but that's, but I set my mind to it. And my mom kept telling me, you, you do whatever you set your mind to it, you can do it. But at school, they had a different opinion, of course. And so when it came time to choose careers, they put me in the direction of being an apprenticeship manager at a chicken packing factory. That's how they saw me. And when I told them what I, what I intended to do, they all laughed at me. My teachers laughed at me. There's my, my colleagues in class laughed at me. Um, but I did it uh, with my mom's help. Uh, I pulled it off and I joined the Royal Navy as an officer in 1979. Well, the, what was that day, like getting the acceptance well, letter? What was that like getting the acceptance letter? Oh, it was, it was huge. It was so big that everybody who had laughed at me changed their attitude immediately. And I became famous in the town of 5,000 people. Come it, got, on. it got in the newspaper. And, you know, we have no chance any of us were going to get the newspaper. But there I am in the newspaper. And I, then I, then I uh, found out for the first time what a little bit of fame feels like because everybody then knows you and everybody wants to know you. Absolutely. Because before, nobody even noticed you. <laughs> you were obscure. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Totally. But the day I joined in the Navy, the, I, I, the irony of the whole thing was I, I joined on the same day that Prince Andrew joined. Wow. 
And so, so, so you couldn't get a bigger contrast. I didn't have a suit or anything. So I had my scruffy clothes. I was on, in the parade square, I'd just been dropped off by, by a Navy truck who picked me up from the railway station. And, and on the other side of the parade ground, in comes a brand new Rolls Royce. <laughs> circles around, chauffeur gets out, opens the back door, and there's Prince Andrew on his first day. Um, it was quite, you couldn't get a bigger contrast. I'll never forget that. I mean, I couldn't think of, a, I couldn't think of anything to say to him. I just sort of stared at him, you know, jaw dropped. It was incredible. Because you're all of a sudden now you're in the same world, which is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it's, you know, now but he was conceptualized as an idea, but now you're like literally right there. All right, let's, wow, we're going to be classmates. That's, I just, you know, there's no, no, no uh, cameras in those days. No, no cell phones, of course, with cameras on them. So I, it was the, the only person who had that moment was me and him. And uh, later on that day, actually, that night, I noticed he was very nervous. And I realized that it was just as hard for him to come out of his world and join what he must have thought was quite a few steps down as it was for me to come out of my world and, and go a few steps up. And, uh, and that was a great lesson for me, That's particularly with starting businesses. And, you know, you, when you start in a business, sometimes... You, you don't feel worthy of being a big company straight away. And I, I've used that mentality to whenever I start a new company, I'm, I'm, I'm on companies uh, five, six, and seven now. So when I start a new company, I imagine the success of the company, even as I'm starting it with nothing, if, you, if that makes sense. Absolutely. When you were, um, so when you get to the Royal Naval Academy, correct? When you got there, what was your confidence up after you, you know, once the acceptance came, yes, you felt you were going into a world where it was uh, so-called above you, meaning that it was higher than you could imagine. But at the same time, did you feel the gasoline and the fuel of saying, man, I made it this far. My mom already told me we, our family came from, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to squander this opportunity. You know, I, I couldn't screw up because I didn't want to go home. After all the, after, after becoming a minor celebrity in the town, I couldn't go home as a, as a, as a failed minor celebrity. That's real. <laughs> At 17, 18 years old. So no, I, I, I had tremendous determination. Didn't know what I was doing, didn't know what I was getting into, but that's, that's what life is like. Um, and, and a good thing happened to me. After about six weeks, the guy who was in charge of, of me and about another 120 people, he called, me, I, he called me out and he says, you know, it's okay to smile. He saw how intense I was. He said, it's okay to smile. And I, and I, I kind of lightened up a little bit. And then six months later, I had his job. He'd moved on. He went off to the fleet and I was in charge of 120 people. And that's how quickly it changes when you, you start to use the right tools. You know, I use my mentality control and I use my dream, my, the vision thing that I'd learned as a kid from all those fantastic biographies. And I just kept, I've just done that all my life. I mean, I have the same hangups as everybody else. I have the same self doubt, even today, the same self doubt, the same second questioning, you know, second guessing all of all these things. All the same hangups, but I and I so I so one of the reasons I wrote the two books and I have two courses to support them is because nobody needs this stuff more than I do, and yeah. so that's kind of the proof of the pudding is in the eating of it. You know, so so if I'm still using them, and you can look back at my you can my track record if you like, and you can see you know su successful companies starting and sold, then you know why not give it a go? When you uh, when when you went off to the Naval Academy and then you start a uh, achieving and you started to realize that now you had almost a new pathway that was forged ahead of you what were uh you let's talk a little bit about xing out the negativity because i know you talked in in your book you talk a lot about and I, I love the uh the reticular activation system you go a little bit more into the secrets of successful startup you op open that up but talk about that kind of the, I guess the, the, the power of choosing what it, what you, what one focuses their mind on and kind of what happens as a result of that. Cause if you have, you had, uh, you know, your educators who didn't see the potential in you, they kind of looked at your environment as a determiner of, well, this here come to the chicken processing plant. And you look <laughs> like, I, there's no way I want to do that. I'm just, can I give me a little more credit? I want to do something, but they're like, well, this is your lot in life. How did you, uh, it was very, it could be, that can be a very hurtful time, but what did you, how did you choose to, to pivot out of that? Um, I, I, I copied or stole the advice of all those bio, um, biographies of those fantastic people and chose to maintain my individuality, not to allow other people to, to cause me to form an opinion of myself, which is basically their opinion of me. You know, like psychologists say, there's, 
There's how we see ourselves, there's how we think other people see us, and then there's how other people actually see us. Um, and most people allow that in. They allow that to influence their decision making for, the, for them. Oftentimes it's done out of love. You know, people could, people could say, oh, come on, you can't do that because they don't want to see you make a fool of yourself. It's not always malicious. It's, it's often kind, actually, and loving. Um, but you, you have to maintain your individuality and you have to say, this is me and I'm going to do this for me. And, and in doing that, you have to build a really strong mentality. And this isn't positive thinking because that's I, I'm, I'm not a fan of positive thinking because it's impossible. Your thoughts are formed in 500 milliseconds. You don't have time to step in front of them and be, you know, be all happy, happy, happy. But what you do have control over is when you've just had a thought that could be self-harming. So let's say I hear somebody say, oh, that Trevor Blake, he'll never make, and this, as this is true, he'll never make a CEO. He can't be his, he can't be his own boss. He, he doesn't have what it takes. Now, my ex-CEO, I overheard my ex-CEO one time telling someone else that. And uh, you know, if I allow that in, I will, I will prove that point. I will be, have to become incapable of being a CEO. Absolutely. And so I build this mentality. So, so the thought's gone in, I can't stop it. And it made me feel a bit lower and lower vibration. But what I can do, what I have 100% control of, is then choose how to react to that thought. And so I will choose to react in a different way. And as soon as I hear things like that, the little voice in my head says, says I am a CEO. So if I hear someone say, he's not, he's not good enough to, to you know, build and sell a company, I am a hugely successful businessman. I have sold my company for a hundred million dollars. That's yeah. going on in my head while other people are trying to put you down. So it's these, just, just these little tools and techniques, not that we need to become saints or anything like that. Just once or twice, you catch yourself having self-harming thoughts and you react to it in a positive way. That is, that's the thing that's made the biggest difference in my life. Talk Thank you for listening to today's episode. Do us a favor. If this was useful in any way for you, please go to iTunes and leave us a review. Reviews will allow others to easily discover the podcast. If you'd like more information and to receive a free download, rediscover your destiny, go to ceoofdestiny.com.